Hi, my name is Eric Pennock. I'm the chair of the APOS Online Media Committee, and I would like to welcome everybody to our webinar presented by members of the UVitis Committee. Before we begin, I just would like to let everybody know that um, if there's anything that you missed or anything that you would like to review, uh, this webinar will be available in about 24 hours at apos.org. And uh, if you click on the Meetings tab, you'll be able to find this webinar as well as past webinars. Or if there are, you have any friends or colleagues that uh, were not able to attend, please let them know that this will be available as well. Um, secondly, if there are any questions, uh, you can look at your GoToWebinar control panel and uh, type in the questions, and we will get to um, as many as we can. Uh, there will be time at the end of the session uh, for all of the questions. And uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the chair of the UVitis committee, Dr. Ginny Utz. Hi there. Thanks for sharing your Saturday morning with us. Um, I just wanted to first start off by uh, introducing our team. Um, we have uh, Dr. Davidson from CHOP um, in ophthalmology, Dr. Lerman from CHOP, who's our rheumatologist, um, Dr. Ganwani uh, from Boston Children's, and Dr. La Martina from um, Boston University, um, Boston Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Alex Levine is also um, helping us as well, but we had some technical difficulties getting his picture up here. All right, so without further ado, I'm gonna start the presentation. There we go. Um, so this is a core concept for the pediatric ophthalmologist. We hope this is relevant to everybody. Um, we just went through our, our I also wanted to uh, also acknowledge the contributions of the other committee members who helped with the content, Dr. Jin, Dr. Stahl, uh, Dr. Bonzak, Dr. Angelis Han, Dr. Jung, and Dr. Cooper. So the course overview entails introduction, a diagnostic workup for new onset uveitis, uh, management guidelines for non-infectious anterior uveitis with a focus on JIA associated uveitis. We will then have case presentations and questions and answers. Um, just uh, in terms of the resources for this presentation, uh, you'll see on your side tab that there are a downloadable um, presentation slides for notes. And then we also provided some bonus material, um, some additional resources and references. So um, the key sign, if you see that throughout the presentation, that means there's a link to an abstract or article um, for a key reference within that, the bonus material. And hungry for more, there's expanded content and resources available in the handout for other topics. Um, shown by a takeout uh, symbol, uh, since we have been doing a lot of takeout lately in this country. <laughs> the course objectives uh, integrate clinical examination findings to arrive at a differential diagnosis. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble with my slides there. There we go. Develop a diagnostic plan for laboratory and imaging studies. Understand the American College of Rheumatology updated guidelines for management of JIA-associated uveitis in systemic treatment, escalation of treatment, and monitoring JIA-associated uveitis. And then we're going to really let this uh, sink in by applying these guidelines to common clinical cases that we encounter every day. Uveitis in children. Can everybody still see my slides? Hello? Yes, we can see them. Okay, good. It says yes. they, gave me they couldn't be seen anymore. All right. Okay, so uh, uveitis in children, um, most cases are not infectious. However, um, that leaves uh, 10 to 15% that will be infectious. And so infectious always needs to be in a differential diagnosis. By far, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, JIA, is the most common systemic association. In terms of location of involvement, uh, anterior is predominant, uh, followed by intermediate hand uveitis and posterior uveitis. Um, infectious causes of uveitis um, are, are many. Um, there's an expanded list available and additional resources. I just wanted to highlight on this list, um, you always need to rule out syphilis and tuberculosis. Um, they can affect any part of the eye and can take on any appearance. So always have those in the back of your mind. Uh, Non-infectious causes of uveitis in children. Um, 
uh, anterior, we've divided into an acute presentation and also the chronic presentation um, with JIA uh, going to be highlighted today. Okay, so diagnostic approach. So the comprehensive history is key. We want history of present illness. Um, and most importantly, we want to get all records. Um, if you know that is so that you don't recreate the wheel um, and really uh, um, go and not chase any, you know, the patient's story. It's best just to have all of the records when you're seeing that patient for the initial appointment, if at all possible. Um, you're going to want to know the clinical course, the current treatments, response to prior treatments. Um, and you're going to want to ask about the temporal progression of disease, the onset, was it acute or happened slowly, uh, the disease course, um, and the response to prior treatments. So an important question, if, the history, if there's a history of ocular hypertension, was the IOP high on presentation or after the steroids were initiated? Uh, sometimes families will brush through the review of systems um, because they think, oh, I'm at the eye doctors. I don't need to tell them about, you know, my stomach pain or, uh, and so it's important just to kind of reinforce some of the key um, uh, review of systems um, when evaluating a patient. Past medical history, especially immune status um, is important. Medications, um, you want to, medications can induce uveitis, so you want to keep that in mind family history of autoimmune diseases, and then social history, you actually have to get pretty good detail. Um, pets, animals, travel history, sexual practices, history of drug use. And do they have a pet tarantula? Um, uh, tarantula hairs cause a uh, carotid uveitis uh, that, that uh, can definitely stump us in the clinic. So you wanna think like house, really put it all together, draw it on the board. Uh, and, and evaluation requires a careful, comprehensive um, examination with descriptive naming. Uh, you want to highlight the pathology, uh, the anatomic location of disease, anterior, intermediate, posterior panuveitis. There are some caveats, uh, as um, CME or papillitis can occur as complications of anterior or intermediate disease and may not be the primary location of the inflammation, so they may be secondary. Um, and then I often get referred patients with anterior intermediate uveitis who really just have anterior vitreous spillover or an erythrocyclitis. Um, what you want to look for is uh, parse plane involvement for intermediate uveitis, no balls, no banking, um, exudate, and then sometimes there's some peripheral uh, vascular sheathing. Key anterior segment findings to keep in mind, this is not an exhaustive list, but just a couple of highlights. Is there a keratitis or an endotheliitis? Because then you start to think more on the viral pathway. What do the keratic precipitates look like? This is very important to document. Size and appearance, are they stellate, granulomatous versus non-granulomatous? And then once again, distribution, are they diffuse, central, paracentral, or an arch triangle? Um, and then the iris, are there nodules? That's gonna lead you down the differential of a granulomatous disorder, synechii, uh, transillumination defects. Um, so quantifying AC cell, thank you. thankfully the Sun Working Group has standardized this for all. Um, I tell my residents not to use the word rare cell um, because that's not part of the Sun nomenclature. It's If there's less than one cell for high power field, that's a grade zero. Uh, and then in addition, um, I document how many cells for high power field for 0 0.5 plus to one plus. Um, for grade 0 0.5 plus, uh, I pay close attention to the presence of new KP and follow-up examinations when trying to determine uh, low-grade activity. Key poster segment findings, vitreous haze, snowbanks, snowballs, exudative detachment, vasculitis. Is it involving the arteries or the veins? Um, infectious lesions, chorioretinal scarring. Importantly, you need to actually evaluate out to the aura serrata if at all possible. Use wide field imaging, whatever you can get to really uh, rule out a, um, uh, an intermediate component. Imaging studies, there are many, um, macular OCT, optic nerve OCT, the wide field imaging and FA can be used. And here are some clinical 
pearls as to when to suspect a viral etiology. So if a patient presents with recurrent or chronic unilateral non-alterating um, chronic uveitis, um, history of ocular hypertension with each episode of uveitis because it's a trabeculitis or inflammation of the trabecular mesh work, um, as opposed to more of a sneaky closure. Um, small central paracentral, occasionally diffuse KP, they appear larger if clumped. Um, I, I say the key thing, it's, it's not definitive, but if uh, the KP extend beyond the mid cornea um, to, to at least have a viral, ask, a viral in your uh, differential diagnosis, look for iris transillumination defects, um, history of keratitis. Here are some case examples. These are pretty severe, um, but there's, there's, there's definitely a phenotypic spectrum, but you can see in both of these cases that there is a uh, corneal stromal involvement. Uh, you want to check corneal sensation prior to anesthesia. In clinical pearl, but my HSV serology was negative. I can't have HSV uveitis. Um, you know, her herpetic viral infection is always a clinical diagnosis. In children, because uh, we have to put them to sleep usually to get an aqueous tap, uh, consider empirical treatment with a cyclovir or valacyclovir if the diagnosis is suspected. Um, and if the patient is not responding to treatment, you can consider aqueous tap for viral PCR or uh, metagenomic deep, deep sequencing uh, for DNA RNA, uh, uh, which is uh, also in your available in your handout, a little more detail on that, it's amazing. Um, even if negative testing, treat as herpetic disease if there's a high index of suspicion. Um, clinical pearls in, in, in terms of select masquerade syndromes in children, uh, there's an extended list in your handout, but keep in mind, um, look very closely at the hypophian. For leukemia, it may be a gray-yellow. There usually will be posterior segment findings. Um, probably the most serious thing to really uh, consider is diffuse infiltrating retinal blastoma. And usually there is a pseudo-hypophian um, and it's white and it changes with head position. So if you have a kid with a hypophian, see if it changes with head position. Uh, and sometimes the posterior segment with a dense vitritis, um, no calcifications on the scan, you may not have a great view of the retina. Uh, so it requires a high index of suspicion, uh, but definitely if someone's not responding to, to traditional treatment or you know, has this clinical picture, uh, it's good to make a referral sooner rather than later. Diagnostic studies, so not even, you know, the most esteemed uveitis specialists um, agree on what diagnostic studies to order. There's no one-size-fits-all panel of testing. Um, it should be guided by the clinical phenotype, risk factors, and pretest probability of disease. For infectious causes, uh, these are some of the labs that, that I consider um, in a child with uveitis. Um, Treponemo-specific testing for, for syphil syphilitic disease um, uh, is important to order. And you actually want to order the treponemo-specific testing either in addition to the RPR or VDRL or at least as, the, as a screening uh, lab. Um, and then if it's positive, consider HIV testing. TB, um, quantifying gold or PPD. Lyme disease based on clinical presentation and region, and consider Bartonella in select cases. Uh, basically, you're trying to get the low-lying fruits. Infection can be treated with antimicrobials, and you can cause a significant amount of morbidity if it's treated as a non-infectious entity. And then, yes, kids can get syphilis, unfortunately. Um, consider any child with uveitis. I have to say, among the committee, we none of us really ordered the same labs for sarcoidosis because it's very hard to diagnose in children. Um, children often do, do not have pulmonary manifestations um, in, if they're less than eight years old. Um, you know, if you can do a biopsy of, of a, a suspicious skin lesion or a conch you know, nodule, that would actually be the best to make a definitive diagnosis. Uh, CBC with differential to rule out a butt blood dyscrasia, systemic infection. Um, ESR, CRP to look for nonspecific inflammation, complete metabolic panel uh, to assess the uh, liver and uh, renal function, and uh, we're finding that tubular interstitial nephritis and uveitis is more common than we thought in children, um, 
and uh, I, I usually order a UA, and if there's uh, the right phenotype, a urine beta-2 microglobulin, and then an ANA. ANA is very, is very nonspecific, but JIA is the most common diagnosis. Um, I'd avoid ordering an ANA panel uh, or a ENA panel unless you have a, a suspicion for lupus or for another connective tissue disorder. Phenotype guided testing. I'm going to go through just a couple of these. This is an asymptomatic white quiet eye with anterior segment inflammation only, cataract and band keratopathy, normal intraocular pressure. So the differential diagnosis is JIA, sarcoidosis, perhaps Fuchs. Um, TINU can sometimes be more of a chronic form. Uh, and so you want to do the typical JIA workup with an ANA, RF, um, and then it, uh, the workup for TINU or sarcoidosis. Now, in contrast, um, you have a unilateral acute onset uveitis with hypopian, relative hypotony, and eye pain in a 10-year-old boy. So your differential here is, you know, HLA-associated acute anterior uveitis, or it could be part of a systemic disorder such as um, HLA B27 associated seronegative spondylopathies, which include enthesitis-related, uh, JIA or inflammatory bowel disease, um, Bechet disease, TINU, um, bacterial endophthalmitis, or a masquerade. Make sure that child you know, moves around for you so you can make sure that hypopene is not moving. Um, and then this drives what you test. You're going to get an HLA B27, um, uh, rheumatology evaluation, GI evaluation, uh, TINU. Uh, Bechet's is a clinical diagnosis, but of course, screen for other uh, organ involvement. And then finally, you can see for an inter intermediate uveitis, um, very different differential diagnosis uh, because you're thinking, well, syphilis, of course, um, but toxoplasmosis, TB, Lyme toxicara, um, sarcoid, uh, multiple sclerosis, usually not to new, but there are some cases reported. And then, of course, idiopathic, which is kind of the blanket term is parsclonitis. And so ordering serology to rule out the infectious causes. Uh, and then if there's a high index of suspicion for sarcoidosis, um, considered a, ch a chest and abdominal CT, or if there are neurologic findings um, and a high suspicion for MS, uh, you can order an MRI, and some will actually order an MRI before prescribing TNF um, inhibitors. More examples of phenotype-driven testing are in your handout. Uh, now I'm going to segue into uh, the main part of our discussion. Um, we've ruled out infection, non-infectious pediatric uveitis, and now we're going to uh, talk about a specific subtype, chronic anterior uveitis um, associated with JIA or idiopathic. This is insidious, persistent, chronic, and recurrent, and a major cause of vision loss in our children. All right, Melissa, you'll, have, you'll take it from here. Good morning. Thank you. That was such a great overview. So um, I am going to be the lone rheumatologist in this group. So I'm going to talk about what I know about, which is arthritis. So we're going to talk and focus on individuals who have JA associated uveitis. Uh, next slide. So depending on when everyone trained, they may be familiar with this disease by different names. Some of us trained with it being called juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, juvenile chronic arthritis. Um, there were different nomenclatures, but more currently we call it juvenile idiopathic arthritis so as to distinguish it from rheumatoid arthritis in adults. But in any case, by whatever name you give this, this is when a child has chronic arthritis, which is arthritis for at least six weeks or more, um, that develops before they're 16 years old. And there are many, many different phenotype subtypes of JIA. Here, wait, hold on a sec. So um, oftentimes as a rheumatologist, we have someone who comes into our office who looks like this little happy-go-lucky girl who you see in this picture. Um, but when we examine her, um, we might see that she has arthritis that is entirely painless. Similarly, the uveitis that's associated with JIA, if we look at this girl's eye, she might have a sneaky eye, um, but she is not complaining of any eye complaints, similar to what Ginny showed on the last slide. So the uveitis associated with JIA is a chronic, usually asymptomatic uveitis. Um, so who amongst individuals with JIA gets uveitis? Well, all comers are at risk. So anytime a child has a diagnosis of JA, they are at risk for uveitis, and it's a lifelong risk. 
but those who have the highest risk are oddly enough those who have the most the, the least systemic involvement. So JA is broken down into seven subtypes. Um, oligoarticular is when you have fewer than five joints involved, so four or fewer. Polyarticular is when you have more than five joints involved. You can have arthritis associated with psoriasis or a family history of psoriasis. You can have a spondyl arthritis spectrum or enthesitis related arthritis, and you can have systemic JAA. Or if you meet multiple criteria, you can be in the undiff category. Oligoarticular is broken down into, let's go back for a sec, is broken down into to those who have a few joints at the beginning and throughout their disease, and then those who develop more joints over time, which is called extended. Those kids act a lot more like polyarticular arthritis. But the children who are at highest risk for a chronic uveitis that can affect different eyes over time, but is bilateral, are the oligoarticulars. As you see, almost half of them get uveitis. But then when you go down and look at individuals with psoriatic or ERA, their risk is much lower. It's about 7%. The one distinguishing feature, as Jenny mentioned already, is that individuals with spondyl arthritis or enthesitis related arthritis tend to have an acute or symptomatic unilateral uveitis, at least in the literature, though they are still at risk for developing asymptomatic uveitis. Next slide. So, why do we care? You can answer that a lot more than I can as ophthalmologists, but because um, it is one of the higher causes of visual morbidity amongst um, children and the rates of visual impairment historically were much higher than they are now because we can treat it. But if it were untreated, um, you can see that um, children have pretty significant visual morbidity up to 25% of them had worse than 2200 vision, and complications can occur in about three quarters of individuals with JA-associated uveitis, despite the fact that the uveitis itself is asymptomatic. One of the things that those of us who see a lot of kids with JA-associated uveitis know is that this greatly impacts the family because kids with uveitis are coming into the ophthalmologist really, really, really frequently. They're using eye drops, they're using systemic agents, but um, their peers and their family members can't see that there's anything wrong with them. Um, and they don't look like they're in pain. And it's really challenging for these individuals to, to cope with that. Next slide. So as I said, all comers are at risk for JA-associated uveitis. And many, many, many studies over the years have tried to tease out what the actual risk factors are for uveitis and JAA. There's no consensus on this, but amongst the studies, the prevalence of data suggests that girlness puts you at higher risk for uveitis, being very young when you have the onset of uveitis, um, and the onset of JAA, being ANA positive, and having that oligoarticular subtype um, put you at higher risk. We know that while it can develop over time at any point, the highest risk is in the first two to four years after diagnosis of JIA, at least in a world where people aren't being treated with systemic agents early on. There are some genetic risk factors, which I've listed here, um, but they are by no means explanatory of all patients with JIA-associated uveitis. So despite the fact that we don't know exactly what puts individuals at risk for JA-associated uveitis, we've tried to develop over the years different screening parameters so we can catch this uveitis early before kids have poor visual outcomes. Many people are probably familiar with the AAP guidelines. Um, the first author was Cassidy, which many of us use for many years to direct the screening for children with JA um, for uveitis. This year, um, the American College of Rheumatology and um, Rheumatology Foundation developed a new set of guidelines, which we are using as rheumatologists and pediatric ophthalmologists should be using. The AAP guidelines will also come out, I believe, this year, and I presume they will be quite similar because it's the same group of people who are developing them. We, but these are a little bit different than the AAP guidelines we're familiar with, but they break individuals down into low risk and moderate high risk. So as we talked about on the left, you see individuals with oligoarticular disease, RF negative polyarthritis, psoriatic arthritis, and undifferentiated arthritis. If they're ANA positive, 
if they're younger than seven, and if they've had disease for less than four years, should be screened every three months. Whereas if they don't have some of these features, they can have screening every six months. If you have systemic JA or polyarticular RF positive or ERA, you're considered low risk and you can have screening every 12 months. Again, it's important to note that these are only screening guidelines before an individual has uveitis. Once they have uveitis, as you well know, they will be coming much more frequently and these guidelines are no longer applicable. Next slide. So in terms of what the risk factors are for developing severe uveitis, as opposed to the risk factors for developing uveitis and for poor visual outcomes, we know that those kids who have uveitis early on in the course of their disease, so maybe their uveitis was diagnosed before their arthritis, which can happen in 12% of kids, or those who have a short duration between their uveitis and arthritis diagnosis are at very high risk for having poor outcome. That may be because they had disease brewing for a lot longer that we didn't appreciate. Whereas if it develops after your diagnosis of JA, you're going for screening and it's gonna be picked up earlier. Um, while girlness makes you at higher risk for developing uveitis, we think boyness puts you at higher risk for poor outcomes. Um, and there are some data that um, non-Hispanic African-Americans are at higher risk for poor outcomes. So how do the eyes and the joints go together? We don't entirely know. So one question people ask is, well, I just had someone who developed um, new uveitis. Do I need to send them back to the rheumatologist to make sure that they don't have arthritis? Because remember, both the arthritis and the uveitis are usually painless. Um, or conversely, if they have a new flare of arthritis, my colleagues in rheumatology ask me, does that mean I need to send them to the ophthalmologist faster? Well, the data, at least from a paper in 1986, which is the only thing in the literature to date, suggests that they do not correlate. Um, so activity in one area doesn't mean they need sooner screening in the other. We do have some newer data where we're looking at our large cohort now that suggests that may not actually be true and their risk of developing uveitis may be higher around an arthritis flare, but we're working on that. Right now, there are no guidelines about that. Suffice it to say that the eyes are usually the thing that's driving systemic medication use, um, whereas the joints are, in a child with oligoarticular JA are often treated with joint injections. So the systemic treatment is going to be driven by their eyes. Next slide. So let's talk about that systemic treatment. So what are the goals of treatment? Again, you all know this better than me, but we want to decrease the inflammation to less than 0.5 plus by sun criteria. We want to reach that control really, really fast um, or as fast as possible. We want to maintain that control without a lot of peaks and valleys. Each peak and valley puts them at higher risk for damage. And we want to limit their steroid exposure because that leads to poor outcomes as well. Next slide. So we're gonna walk through the step ladder. You don't need to read it right now, but this is going to be sort of a step ladder approach to treating chronic anterior uveitis. Next slide. And again, the ACR guidelines, ACR AF guidelines that I just mentioned are both screening guidelines, monitoring guidelines and treatment guidelines. And so we're gonna talk through these new guidelines today. There are a number of other recent guidelines that have come out from international groups, from European and German groups, which I've listed here and they will be in their hand, your handout. They're quite similar. All of them are really consensus based, some Delphi, some not, um, with some degree of data drivenness, but there are they're largely consensus-based criteria. Next slide. So this is an overview of how the ACR recommends treatment be initiated. We're going to walk through this in more detail, but this um, you can put this up on your wall and this really tells you what they recommend. Next slide. Okay, so if you have a patient who comes to you um, they have JAA and you diagnose them with new onset chronic uveitis or they have a recurrence of their uveitis, the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to use eye drops. Is, um, and ideally, you're going to start with Predforte is what these recommend rather than Durazol. Um, and you're going to start with topical steroids, which is really the important point of this slide, rather than systemic agents. Next slide. But 
what happens if these kids are steroid dependent or steroid resistant, if you can't taper the, to fewer or equal to two drops over about three months in time, or if they keep flaring every time you taper, these are the kids that you want to start a systemic agent on. So this is when you wanna reach out to your rheumatology colleagues to help you manage their treatment. And so the next rung above, above topicals is conventional steroid sparing immunomodulatory medications, which is a mouthful. We like to refer to these as DMARDs. Um, next slide. And so DMARDs are disease modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. The one that most of you are gonna have care the most about is methotrexate. Other agents in this class are listed below. These are the drugs that we use as rheumatologists, the drugs that a lot of transplant doctors will use, um, and we, we share the same agents. But methotrexate is our first choice agent. Next slide. And that's the agent that the ACR guidelines recommend you reach for first. That's because we think that methotrexate works for about 75% of kids with JAU of those who need, who need a systemic agent. So it's quite effective. Methotrexate is, we as rheumatologists think of it as a pretty benign medication. It's administered either orally or by subcutaneous injection at home. We recommend subcutaneous injection as being a little more bioavailable. Um, it's only a once a week medication. It's not a daily drug. And um, patients are gonna be worried when they Google this drug because they're gonna read about it as a chemotherapeutic, but we're not using it for that reason. We're using it in much, much, much lower doses than the oncologists are using. So the side effect profile is quite different. It's very well tolerated. Some kids will have a little bit of fatigue or nausea the day after, which we can limit by giving them folic acid supplementation. We do need to check their labs every three to four months just to look for cytopenias, which are rare. Um, the bigger risk is um, transaminitis, and this is reversible if you bring the dose down. One thing as pediatricians that it's important to note is that the guidelines is that individuals on methotrexate do not receive live virus vaccinations. They do receive all non-live virus vaccinations. Um, and in periods of pandemics, um, at least when we thought about measles pandemics, there is some literature to suggest that live virus vaccines are actually pr pretty low risk. So you might even consider giving it to kids on methotrexate. The concern is less that they're gonna get the disease um, and more that they just won't mount a good response. Next slide. Okay, but then what happens when you have your little girl on methotrexate for three months? It takes about three months for the medication to fully become effective, four, four weeks to three months. So you wouldn't call it a failure before three months unless someone was having really bad complications. And she still has active uveitis. Um, you can't taper, taper the drops or she's developing complications. So then what do you do? Then you reach for our newer agents, our biologic DMARDs. And it's important to note that you're gonna add on an agent or your rheumatologist you're working with is going to add on, not switch. So you're not stopping methotrexate and starting a new drug, it's an additive treatment approach. Next slide. So these are the drugs that are really, really expensive um, that drive healthcare costs and that you see advertisements for on TV. Um, and people think about these as quote unquote potent drugs and they're more afraid of these drugs than they are of, of old school drugs like methotrexate. That is probably not necessarily accurate these are actually very targeted drugs, whereas methotrexate will go in and sort of squash all your inflammation. Biologics are targeted against particular chemicals or particular pathways. Um, and so we can attempt to limit inflammation by one route that could be driving inflammation, but not limit all inflammation that would put individuals at higher risk for infection. So there's an alphabet soup of biologics. I've listed some of them out here. Um, and new ones are coming out every day, new classes and new agents within each class. But the first ones that we will reach for and that the guidelines recommend are those that block tumor necrosis factor alpha. So TNF alpha, next slide. The agents that work for uveitis are those that are monoclonal antibodies directed towards TNF alpha. Embryl, a tannercept, is actually a TNF blocker that is a soluble receptor. It does not work for uveitis. Um, and kids who are on Embryl for their JAA 
are at relatively high risk for developing uveitis. So the agents that people are going to reach for are either infliximab, Remicade, which is an IV administered medication. It's a chimeric antibody, so it is partially mouse, partially human, or adalimumab, which is a fully humanized monoclonal antibody. And this is delivered by subcutaneous injection at home, um, which is great because kids don't need to come in for IV treatment. What we know, next slide. Next slide. So what we talk about is I talk about the rule of uh, three quarters. So three quarters of kids who fail topicals and use methotrexate will succeed. Three quarters of those kids who go on methotrexate, um, who, who go past methotrexate to TNF inhibitors um, will respond to TNF inhibitors. Whether or not adalimumab or infliximab is better um, is sort of up for grabs. Different studies show different things. Um, adalimumab is quite easy to administer. You don't need an infusion unit. So many people will reach for adalimumab first. Um, the things to know about TNF inhibitors is that um, you are at higher risk for not fighting off tuberculosis if you're infected. So it's important that an individual be tested for that before they start a TNF inhibitor. Um, and then in areas where there is a lot of TB, you have to keep that in your radar. These agents are actually less likely to lead to blood count abnormalities. So if you're on monotherapy, you need labs only every six months. Though, as I said, most people are going to be on dual therapy with methotrexate, so they're still getting labs every three months. These medicines don't make you nauseous, don't make you headachy, so most people tolerate them really well. Next slide. So as I said, everyone's always afraid of the biologics. They're the big bad drugs. Um, and they, they have the word tumor in them, so people are quite worried about them. As rheumatologists, we found these agents to be incredibly safe, particularly in children. Um, the risk factors are slightly different in adults, but in children, um, they're quite safe. And here is data from a large meta-analysis of about 600 kids who are treated with adalimumab. Remember, that's Humira, with about 1,500 patient years of data. And this showed that they were very few minor adverse events. And then serious infections, um, there were four per person year, which is quite low. This included all comers, so individuals with JA, with psoriasis, with Crohn's disease. The risk factor is highest for those with Crohn's disease, lowest for those with psoriasis, and intermediate for JA. But again, it's still incredibly low. So we I can't think of a single kid, one child in all the years I've used these agents who's developed a serious infection um, because that is necessitated stopping the drug. And the other thing people are worried about is a risk of malignancy. This is a whole other conversation we can have, but in this large database, there were zero malignancies noted. So we think of these as really, really safe drugs and very effective, obviously. What if your TNF inhibitor isn't working or is kind of working, but not quite working enough that you're under full control? So what are some of the strategies that you can use to improve this? So this could be because the dose is insufficient, next. This could be because individuals are developing antibodies to the drugs. This could be, next, because of non-adherence. So let's talk about these a little more in detail. So infliximab is an IV medication, which for um, IVD, most people are using at three to five mg per kg. For uveitis, we know that kids need higher doses. Um, some people are not comfortable with that. So if they're at five mg per kg and they're still active, you wanna bump their dose up. My practice is to start at 10 mg per kg, and then I'll go up to 20 mg per kg if necessary. Adalimumab is a medication that is um, approved for uveitis, and it's approved as an every other week medication. Um, but what we find is that many kids with uveitis actually require weekly treatment of adalimumab. And this used to be really difficult to get through insurance. We're being much more successful at that recently. Or sometimes we'll do a double dose every other week if kids really don't tolerate infections well. Um, but there are a lot of things that we can do to up the dose. We don't know if it has to do with a blood-brain barrier issue, but the eyes seem to need higher doses than other systemic manifestations. So those are one thing you can do to improve response to TNF inhibitors. We'll talk about neutralizing antibodies. Um, in the next slide, 
and then obviously they might not work if you're not using them. So one of the downsides of, of adalimumab, which people give at home, is that some people don't give it at home. You can draw blood levels to look to see whether or not someone's receiving the medication. Um, and some families, and we'll talk about this later, where you really don't think the family is able to maintain um, medication administration regularly, that might be one reason why you would choose an IV medicine like infliximab, because then we know that they're getting it. Next, can you do a couple pushes of the next, next, and then one more. Um, the other thing to remember, as I said, we have dual therapy with methotrexate and with the TNF inhibitor. Um, we can also play with the doses of the, of the methotrexate. We can increase the dose if they're getting it orally. We can make it subcutaneous. So sometimes we'll maximize the DMARD before we move on to another agent. Next. So because these are big, large protein drugs, our bodies can make immune responses to the drug. So we make antibodies to the antibodies, which is very unfortunate. Um, and I mentioned that some drugs are chimeric and some drugs are fully human. Um, the early agents um, had some mouseness and our bodies would mount a response to the mouseness. So the idea was that people developed antibodies to infliximab um, more so than they did to adalimumab because adalimumab is fully human. Um, we're actually seeing that people make antibodies to both of these agents at much higher rates than we used to think. Why do we care if you develop antibodies? Um, some antibodies might do nothing and we might just be finding them by blood tests, but the presence of antibodies in many individuals may increase the risk of having an adverse reaction. So you can have anaphylaxis or something else if you have antibodies, or they may, what we see more frequently, simply decrease the effect of the drug. We think that actually higher doses and more frequent administration of the drug puts you at lower risk for developing tolerance Whereas if you're on infliximab every eight weeks at three mg per kg, you're more likely to develop antibodies, which is sort of IBD dosing, than if you're on 10 mg per kg every four weeks. Um, and this was shown in some of the papers that I've attached below. And importantly, one of the other reasons we have people stay on their DMARD while they're on a TNF inhibitor is not just to treat their uveitis, but because these have been shown to limit the tolerance development to the TNF inhibitors. So it's really, really important that you have your kids stay on their DMARD, even if they say, well, it didn't help me, why do I need to stay on it? And that's so the TNF inhibitor stays working. Next slide. So what if you do all these things and they still have active disease? Well, not to worry, we have other tricks up our sleeve. Um, Dr. Davidson will talk about these a little bit more, um, but we can either go on to other agents that block other mechanisms, other cytokines, um, or other pathways involved in inflammation. Next. 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 Okay. So what I've shown you is we have a step ladder approach and we climb up the stairs relatively gingerly, usually with three month intervals between each uh, uh, consideration of failure. But what you can see on the right is that if someone starts out um, with severe um, vision threatening disease or terrible complications that they come in with um, light perception only, or they have um, horrible increased pressure or other issues, you may skip the certain rungs of the ladder and move right up. So if we have a kid come in with terrible uveitis, we'll start methotrexate and Remicade simultaneously in that individual. Next slide. Okay, and so then you've reached control. What do you do? Can you stop your medicines right away? Everyone says, I'm great, I wanna stop. I hate having my kids on all these medicines. No. So we climbed up gingerly and we need to climb down relatively gingerly as well. And so the guidelines recommend that an individual have at least two years of controlled disease, two years from weaning to very low or off topical steroids before you even think about decreasing their controlling agent. We don't yet have biomarkers for this. There was a thought that S100 might be helpful, but we don't think it is right now. Um, but you wanna give them at least two years of quiet disease before you come off the drug. And even then, we don't come off the drug cold turkey, then we go through a weaning process. 
and how we should wean is an area under discussion. Um, do you wean frequency? Do you wean dose? Do you wean the TNF inhibitor or the DMARD first? These are really the open questions that we're, that we're trying to understand. Um, so hopefully there'll be more information on this in the future. But that's a quick overview to the drugs that we use to help you treat uveitis. Melissa, we have a, uh, a question that you can answer probably pretty quickly uh, before we go on to the next presentation. There's a question, what is enthesitis related JIA? Um, and there is arthritis is when an individual has arthritis and or enthesitis, which is inflammation where the tendons and ligaments insert onto the bones. So they kind of feel like they have joint pain, but it's actually um, tendon inflammation rather than joint inflammation. This tends to be on the spectrum of people who will develop AS or ankylosing spondylitis in adulthood. Um, it tends to be boys more than girls and it's an older onset, so older than six years old. Um, and so they often are at adulthood at risk for having a lot of axial disease, so spinal involvement. These kids tend to be really, really stiff in the morning and get better as they move around. Um, and one question, perhaps for the ophthalmologist, um, how do you taper in three months when methotrexate takes uh, three months to work? Great question. How do you tape? Uh, so when we taper, I'm not quite sure if this is the question, but we wait at least um, three months with every step down of methotrexate before we taper further. So if we have someone controlled and there are methotrexate monotherapy and we say we're ready to taper, if they're on 25 milligrams sub Q, I may bring them down to 17 and a half milligrams for three months and make sure they stay quiet before I bring them down to 12 and a half. So yeah, we do wait those three month intervals. That's a great question. Wow. Uh, they, I think that what they were wondering is tapering off the prednisolone acetate. Um, and, you know, I would, uh, because it, uh, methotrexate, so three months is where we're kind of at that, uh, where we're trying to decide whether or not it's, it's working. Um, but the tapering can, can, of uh, the prednisolone acetate can actually, uh, start before then. Um, you know, I usually actually start to taper uh, at about six weeks, just very slowly. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, you know, three months is, is, uh, you know, that's the recommendation, but there's always some gray areas um, and patient specific factors. Yeah, and it's like three months is when, if it hasn't worked, you're not gonna get any more bang for your buck after three months. But it, yeah, definitely some people think it works in four to six weeks in some individuals. So um, it's really, um, you wouldn't consider it a full failure until three months, but it's probably doing something. So you can wean your steroids in the interim. And if but I, it is important to- Go ahead. It, it is important to keep in mind that it does work more slowly, and so you do want to think about how you are tapering the steroid. So in general, I, I this is Stephanie Davidson, I taper slowly with generally two-week blocks before I make an additional change to decreasing the frequency of the drop usage. And if I see that a patient has an escalation of their uveitis as I'm tapering, I don't call that a methotrexate failure if it's within that three block of time, three month block of time. So if I'm tapering in the first four to six weeks and I see the uveitis increase activity, I'll go back up on the, on the drops and still say to the family, methotrexate could still work, let's go a little more slowly and try to time the discontinuation of the steroid to when the methotrexate would be more effective. And I think Stephanie's point, this is Alex Levin, is underscoring one other point that the question was asking. Just because you're on methotrexate doesn't give you the license to wean. You still have to have control of the disease from the methotrexate before you start mm -hmm. weaning. So it's not like you start your methotrexate and wean the next day. You have to be controlled in order to justify any weaning. And this is Casey Lamatina. I would add one other thing, which is that it's very important just to see at every stage of the taper, you examine the patient before you make another move. You don't do, I don't usually do two jumps of, of a taper on a kid with, uh, in a kid who has GIA uveitis without seeing them at each stage. Um, and that's because you'll start to see um, early signs of cell coming back uh, pretty quickly if you, if you are still dependent on that steroid. And similarly at the tail end, when we're tapering, we do the same thing. We before um, we tend to see people at the end of each dosing interval 
um, to make sure that they've maintained, if we space from four to six weeks on infliximab, we want to see them at that five, six week mark to make sure that they've made it out that far. So it's going up and down the ladder, we do the same thing. All right, let's move on to the next presentation. There are a lot of good questions here. And if we don't, we aren't able to address all of them, we will absolutely address them and uh, create a handout of, of the questions and answers so that all your questions are answered. All right, moving on to the next presentation. Dr. Lavatina, take it away. Thank you so much, Jenny. I'd like to thank everybody for uh, joining us this morning. We as committee members clearly have a passion for pediatric uveitis, but to see so many APOS members who also wanna join us on their Memorial Day weekend really is, is really encouraging and, and wonderful, so thank you. And I'd also like to thank both um, Ginny and Melissa for giving us really great overviews of, of um, all of these things, you know, all of the different presentations of uveitis, infectious and non-infectious, as well as these, these focused non-infectious treatments, because that is, again, the gist of what we're seeing. We're seeing the most of that. And so going through all of that with such a nice overview is really helpful. And now we're going to get into some case, um, case studies and, and case presentations in order to further elucidate the what we do and how we do it when we're when we're actually seeing these patients in our office we can go to the first slide so this is a 21 month old little girl that i saw she had presented to her pediatrician with right knee swelling and her pediatrician started her on naproxen and pretty quickly started a workup and uh, this this came to our attention much more quickly than a lot of cases will, and that was in part because there was a family history. Mom had JIA, and so the pediatrician was on top of her game and got her in um, to see me really quickly, got the lab sent, and was was starting this workup really, really um, very timely and and helped probably prevent prevent um, delay and, and diagnosis, which is great. We can go to the next slide. So um, one point that I, I always try to, to stress to my residents and, um, and anybody I'm talking with is that nothing, nothing uh, substitutes our standard slit lamp examination. Handheld slit lamps are really great for identifying, for identifying complications such as band keratopathy, uh, cataracts, semechiae, but you really can't assess cell accurately with a handheld slit lamp. And that's in part because the, the brightness just can't quite get, get up to what our standard slit lamps can. And so it's really important to try and get an exam at the slit lamp. We benefit in these cases if we know that there's a concern for JIA or if there's a concern for uveitis, when they come to our office, we have that in the back of our mind already. Whenever I see any patient for a new uveitis consult, I always see them before any drops are given, which in kids in particular is really helpful because they are not yet in that a uh, fear fear of drop stage when they're first seeing you, particularly if they haven't seen another ophthalmologist at this point, they don't necessarily associate all of our equipment with, with eye drops. And so we get involved early and we, and we um, are able to, to do our initial slit lamp examination quickly um, in the exam to, to assess whether they're cell. And if they fail that first exam, I will actually give them a second opportunity. I don't go straight to an EUA again, because as you can see from, from my colleague, uh, Dr. Goldstein had, had actually brought the slit lamp to, to the OR with the child intubated in order to, in order to really facilitate, uh, facilitate that accurate examination. Um, and so to avoid that, I usually give them a second try and most kids are able to, uh, you know, to do a slit lamp examination at one of those first two visits. It's really, um, in in, uh, in my experience, only kids uh, who maybe are on the autism spectrum who have a difficult time those first two times. But even then, um, if you are working with the kids and, and you stress to them at that first exam that when they come back, there aren't going to be any eye drops. They know that coming in. It's a little bit less fearful that second time, and you're usually able to get a pretty good slit lamp exam. So this particular child uh, had one plus cell bilaterally and didn't have any complications on her initial exam. Uh, next slide. So because of this family history, because of the presentation, she actually fell very nicely into, into that um, oligoarticular arthritis picture that Melissa described in terms of being those high risk factors by being female, by her young age. Um, she ultimately proved to be ANA positive and, and have persistent oligoarticular disease. So that fit her really nicely in this, what we expect for, for these kids who are going to have, who are going to have a more chronic anterior uveitis picture. 
Um, so we were operating with that assumption, which later proved to be true. And we started her on uh, prednisolone acetate QID. So in my experience for one plus cell, uh, QID actually is adequate dosing for a lot of these patients. The thing that's really important for any patient you're giving a steroid to is that you tell them they need to shake the bottle really well. So uh, for a brand name Predforte, it's ground a bit more finely, so they need to shake it about 30 times to resuspend uh, to resuspend the medication. For uh, the generic, it's actually not ground quite as finely, so they really need to shake it about 50 times. I've had kids who have come into my office, uh, kids and adults for that matter, who have significant inflammation still, in spite of supposedly using, using Predforte uh, every hour. And usually what I find is when they hear shake well, they think vigorous two or three times, as opposed to you really need to shake it up because it is a suspension and you need to reconstitute that suspension. The other thing um, I will just reiterate that, that Melissa brought up is that we really avoid Durazol in kids, and that's because they just have a much higher, higher risk of complications than adults. They are more prone to developing cataracts, and about two-thirds of kids will actually develop pressure spikes over 30. So we tend to be much more wary of using Durazol in children. So with this child, because we were anticipating that this was going to be a chronic illness, we, we had the benefit of knowing of knowing mom's course. Um, we were already coordinating with Broom to start immunomodulatory therapy. And as Melissa explained so nicely, we, we start with methotrexate. Methotrexate also um, is something where we may use higher dosing for uveitis control than we would use for, for rheumatology uh, on the rheumatology side of things, where they may start with 0.5 mg per kg. We usually start with one mg per kg. A lot of these these uh, uveitides require require more immunosuppression than our than our rheumatology colleagues will start with for the systemic disease. Um, and our maximum dose for for that methotrexate is 25 milligrams uh, per week uh, subcutaneous. Next slide. So this is a really easy, straightforward case. I think everybody would probably feel comfortable with, with this kind of history. As I said, this is a kid who fit all of those high risk. Um, high risk factors for JIA uveitis in addition to having this family history. That is not going to be every case, obviously, and there are going to be kids who come in or, or calls that you get where it's not quite so straightforward. So um, uh, you can advance. So first question is, when do you see a patient? If you get a call from a pediatrician who says, I have a child who has unilateral joint swelling, you know, right knee swelling, when do you want to see this kid? When should we refer this kid? Sooner rather than later. So, so I usually try and get the kids into my next clinic that I have uh, that I have within a week or so, um, and try to try to help in terms of that workup because the presence of the presence of eye inflammation is going to be indicative to us that this is probably going this is probably going down this path of of being a chronic a chronic presentation a chronic illness um, and also because the the as we've talked about the, there aren't symptoms with this disease and you can get compli really significant complications in kids um, that that have gone on, uh, unnoticed because of the lack of symptoms um, you can advance and so the other question is, okay, so this was a kid who I was able to start on four times a day, uh, prednisolone, who did really well, but when would I have thought about doing oral steroids and how quickly am I starting to think about IMT? Um, so in terms of oral steroids, I usually will start those if I see complications because that is, is an indication to me that this has been a chronic process already. If the kid already has synechiae, especially if they have a cataract or band keratopathy, this inflammation has been going on for a long time. And as Melissa said, it's really important to get that under control quickly. Um, and the other factor is how severe is the inflammation? Particularly if there's um, vitriol inflammation, if there's vitritis, a lot of these kids are still within that amblyogenic age range. And so we really need to get things under control quickly. And that's when I'm thinking about oral steroids. And that kind of goes hand in hand, where if I'm thinking about oral steroids at that first visit, I'm already talking to rheumatology. I'm already getting them set up with a rheumatology visit because if it's already that severe on presentation, this is a kid who's going, who's going to be, be walking down that path. And as, as Melissa said nicely, sometimes we even do jump the ladder and, and start the uh, biologics as, uh, at the same time as we're starting, um, starting methotrexate if we're concerned. The biologics do have the benefit of working a bit more quickly. So when you have a, a child who has severe complications or who has really severe inflammation, that's when you're thinking that these, these may be the agents that you need to be thinking about. Uh, next slide. 
And so again, we, we talked a little bit about the step ladder in this first case where we're at those bottom rungs. We're able to control this with topical steroids, but because there's arthritis and uveitis on presentation, we're already, we're already looking down the line to starting out methotrexate and, and trying to get that on board quickly. Next slide. And so our uh, take home points for this case really are, there's no substitute for standard slit lamps, um, that shaking the bottle well means 30 to 50 times, depending on your formulation, that we don't like to use diflupredinate or durazol in, in kids because they have a higher rate of complications. And that early initiation of IMP in these cases is really important because they can develop severe complications and be really difficult to manage down the line. We wanna avoid getting into, into that position. Thank you very much. All right, I think we've got time for a question here. Um, can anybody uh, comment on use of Ozerdex or uh, intraocular implants, uh, corticosteroids, um, and, and the role, role in the use of children? Um, so what I would say is that um, those, any any sort of um, intravitreal implant or injection is for me um, a, a temporizing measure, the same way I think of oral steroids being a temporary treatment. And that's just because the long-term complications, that, that the rate of, of cataract and glaucoma formation, we don't want to go into the eyes of kids with uveitis. We are, our goal uh, uh, in their management is to avoid that. And so while I regularly use those agents for my adult uveitis patients, they're not often things that I even offer, uh, um, offer to the parents of, of children because it means that it's going, it's going to be a more long-term um, risk to their, to their developing those secondary complications. I do use, I do sometimes use them uh, initially to sort of get things under control while the other agents start to take effect. But any kid that's getting any sort of intervention with a steroid injection is also a kid who's I'm planning on using, on using long-term uh, immunomodulatory therapy. Great, thank you, Casey. Um, we're gonna be going on to the next case presentation um, by Dr. Ganwani. Go ahead and take it away. Dr. Ganwani? There we go, thank you. Um, thank you. All right, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us this morning. Uh, we have a wonderful quorum here, and uh, hopefully we are all learning in the process. Um, we heard some wonderful talks this morning from uh, uh, Ginny and Melissa uh, laying down the framework for us. Um, uh, so, uh, and then these case presentations will uh, hopefully reinforce those concepts. Uh, we heard a case from Casey uh, with a new onset uveitis and how you're going to take the first step. And I'm gonna take here from here to the next level. Uh, next please. Okay, so coming to my case, uh, she's a six and a half year old girl uh, with GLA associated chronic anterior uveitis that is involving just her left eye uh, who presents for a follow-up exam. Um, so her uveitis has recently become active and she's undergoing a tapering regimen. Um, so she's currently on PRED acetate three times a day, cyclopentolate once at night, and she's getting subcutaneous methotrexate. Um, so she was non-adherent to methotrexate prior to this recent flare. I'm, come to, I'm gonna come to that in a minute, uh, but she has had no active joint pain since uh, she was three years old. Um, next, please. Um, so uh, giving some background history here. So she is an ANA negative oligular articular GIA, and that was diagnosed at age two for her. Uh, it was mainly involving her left knee and right elbow. Uh, so she was started with naproxen um, and she did get some steroid injection in the joint to help, but then eventually we had to put her on oral methotrexate uh, just to control her arthritis part. She had no uveitis at that time and that was started at age three for her. Um, so the oral methotrexate worked great in the first year, uh, but then um, she started to refuse taking the oral methotrexate. She had a behavioral response when uh, she would really scream and cry, uh, when mom would try to give her the methotrexate uh, with her best juice, food, uh, it wasn't really working well. Um, and um, 
around that time, uh, she got her first episode of uveitis involving her left eye when she was four and a half years old. Uh, so during that episode, uh, she was switched to subcutaneous methotrexate, um, um, given that she wasn't very adherent to it. And uh, um, uh, that episode was basically controlled uh, with topical medications. Uh, so that subcutaneous methotrexate was going on well uh, until uh, she started to dislike the injections, uh, which led us to this current episode. Um, so we did have to involve a social worker to, to ensure that um, she is taking her subcutaneous methotrexate at home. So let's come back to our current exam. Um, so her right eye is still normal. The uveitis is, is mainly involving her left eye. Uh, the vision in her left eye was 20, 30 minus one. Um, she has mild myopic astigmatism, uh, which is little more in the left eye, but she doesn't have any amblyopia in that eye. Uh, her IOP looks great, 11 and 12. Uh, the slit lamp exam uh, in that left eye shows fine KPs inferiorly in the arch triangle. Uh, she has one synechia at seven o'clock, um, about two plus cells and one plus flare uh, using the sun criteria. Um, she has few pigments over her anterior lens capsule. Uh, and her posterior segment exam looks unremarkable. Uh, next, please. Uh, so we did start her on uh, topical steroids six times a day. And then uh, uh, this current exam, she was being tapered. So she was tapered to three times a day when I saw her for this visit. And you can see that her inflammation was two plus when we saw her uh, this time. So I increased her um, spread acetate to four times a day again. And then um, we bumped up her methotrexate subcutaneous to 25 milligram weekly. She was on about 20 milligram before. Um, so um, then we again attempted a taper, but could not taper her to three drops per day. And the uh, inflammation just persisted one plus two over the next two months. Um, next, please. Um, so what comes next? So we have a case, we have a patient here. We are unable to taper the pred acetate less than three drops. After four, little more than four months, uh, she is already getting 25 milligram methotrexate subcutaneously. Uh, and as we learned from Melissa, uh, if that's not helping, I think it's time to go to the next step. Uh, so we already saw that step ladder before. So uh, next in the step is the, the TNF alpha inhibitors or the, the biologic agents. Uh, so we have two options at this time. It could be Humira, that is Aralimabab, or the Remicade, that is Infliximab. Some points that I keep in mind um, is uh, Humira, it can be given subcutaneous. You can do it at home. She's already getting subcutaneous methotrexate, so she could do subcutaneous Humira at home. Uh, uh, other advantage, Humira is fully uh, humanized, so it's less immunogenic. Uh, and uh, uh, it is FDA approved for children over two years of age uh, for pediatric uveitis. Uh, compared to that, with Remicade, uh, you need to um, uh, give it with an IV infusion. So the patient really needs to come to the infusion center. Uh, as we learned from Melissa, uh, these are chimeric monoclonal antibodies, so they are a little more immunogenic. There's a very rare chance of malignancy with that. Um, next, please. Uh, but we already know with our patient, um, she wasn't very adherent first to the oral and then to the subcutaneous. So uh, I think the overall consensus was we have to put her on infliximab infusion. So we started six milligram per keg um, uh, every four weeks after the loading dose at uh, zero and two weeks. Um, so as we learned, we continued her methotrexate to prevent the development of antichimeric antibodies. Uh, so she tolerated the combination uh, really well. Um, next, please. So after six to eight weeks of that combined therapy of methotrexate and infliximab, her inflammation was well controlled. She had like two cells for high power field uh, in that left eye, and then we could successfully taper off her um, topical steroids. Um, next, please. So uh, I want to um, uh, admit that she did miss 
two, three infusions. So, but because she was on the infusion, we could really track her down. So we, the social worker would call her back again. We would make sure we would bring her into the clinic and ensure that she is getting her medication. I think that was the biggest advantage uh, to keep her on track uh, and uh, to improve the adherence for her. Uh, fortunately, she had no recurrence of uveitis on the combination of methotrexate and infliximab, which has been two years now. Uh, and we have recently started tapering her uh, systemic uh, uh, immunotherapy. Um, next please. Um, so to summarize, I would say pediatric uveitis is very challenging. Um, for some patients, it's a really long and tough course. Uh, they have to come for the frequent visits. They have multiple medications to use. Some of them are uh, injectables, infusions, and don't forget the blood testing that they need to get every three months. Uh, to monitor the, the for the side effects of these drugs. So um, it could be really challenging. So adherence can become an issue. We have already seen from our adult population too, uh, uh, who need lifelong medications for glaucoma, how difficult it is. And then they are just kids. So you, you might see them give up. So I think it's very important to have a team approach. Don't hesitate to involve the, um, the social worker um, a child psychologist if needed, uh, and then team up with the rheumatologist, come up with the best plan that works for the patient, that works for the family, uh, to ensure that regular follow-up. Uh, I cannot overemphasize um, the importance of timely management uh, using the step ladder approach that we have been hammering uh, in our every presentation since this morning. Uh, thank you so much. That was great. I like that you uh, involved the social worker. Sometimes we have to call child protective services, but it's our responsibility to um, make sure that that child uh, maintains vision into adulthood. Uh, the parents can't make that choice for them, or the child can't make the choice the parents are making. Um, Absolutely. I think that's I think one is the younger population where they depend on the parents. So I think we have to make sure the caregivers are sincere enough to take care of all the medication regimen. I think the other group that's challenging is the teenagers uh, who really, um, they, they want to be independent, they want to do the self-medication, which sometimes doesn't work. So I think those two ages are really uh, challenging uh, for management of pediatric uveitis. Yes, there's definitely a psychosocial aspect and um, even a grieving, um, course of events that occurs in terms of families dealing with this diagnosis. That was wonderful. Uh, I think we'll go on to the next talk here. It's uh, Dr. Levin. Hi, thanks very much. Uh, I wanna begin by thanking all of you for attending, for uh, including me in this great talks. So really enjoyed listening to this, but the most credit goes to Ginny, our fearless leader who put this all together and has really been a, a wonderful uh, organizer uh, and teacher during this whole process. I also just want to begin with one quick editorial comment. Uh, KC uh, made the uh, important point that the shaking of the bottle is so important. And some of you might have thought that's really crazy 50 times. But that was originally discovered by Leonard Apt, one of the heroes in the field of pediatric ophthalmology, the first double-boarded pediatric ophthalmologist pediatrician many, many years ago, and it's certainly true. Uh, next slide. So I get to talk about the worst thing about JIA, uh, and that is the worst cases of JIA. And I think it's important to just dwell for a moment on the fact that this disease can be very, very bad. And we sometimes forget that. Uh, you can have a wheelchair-bound child with crippling joint disease. Uh, even in our agents' uh, day of more up-to-date agents today, systemic symptoms such as uh, the pain, the drug side effects, uh, are, are really uh, real things to consider. And then we've heard many times the mention of the depression and anxiety that these kids can go through, uh, multiple visits to the doctor, injections, infusions, not to mention the visual complications, surgery occasionally, all of these things really upset the life of the children and their families. Next slide. The uveitis itself can be bad. And you know, you can have exudative retinal detachment disease, hand uveitis in this disease, vitritis, papillitis, pars planitis. All of these things, I've often seen people say, oh, it can't be JIA if you have them. 
but it can be JIA, uh, and especially for the late presenting or undertreated children. Of course, complications can progress to cyclic membranes and hypotony, and permanent vision loss is seen in a significant number of children. Next slide. When we see a kid walk in like this, we're really in trouble. We're way down the line. This kid is an eye, especially if it's asymptomatic, it's JIA till proven otherwise, uh, and we need to really get on this if we're gonna have any hope of saving this eye. Next slide. This is a paper, it was the first paper, and really one of the classics in the literature from 1987, every single paper since then has shown this paper to be true in the same way. If a child presents at their first examination with no synechiae, these numbers, and again, this was back in 87 where our treatment options were uh, much less, 28% chance of cataract, 70% glaucoma, 5% ban, and 3% less than 2200. Next slide. If the kid comes to you and they've already got a synechiae, look at the incidence jumps in each of these complications, but 58% less than 2,200. Uh, I mean, we could do better than that with our current agents, but it shows you that the further down the line the child presents, the harder you are, the, the deeper you are in the well, and the more difficult it is to climb out. Next slide. In fact, um, uh, and this is a more recent slide showing exactly the same thing. Here's 2020, and we can see that kids who present with synechiae on presentation are in trouble. And when we see that, we know that these are the kids that we're going to have to hit harder in order to get a more desirable outcome. Next slide. The other thing to be asking yourself is how long, how far am I down the line now? And how can I set the parent up to understand that we're moving forward in a situation where maybe not all hope is lost, but where we're going to be expecting a more serious, a more chronic situation and getting the support in place, both from our rheumatologist and also from social work and other means to support these families. Next slide. Another thing that's important to recognize, and this is these statements are true for JIA, but may not be true for other diseases. In JIA, bad uveitis can be found in an absolutely well child. We know that 10% of uveitis presents before the joint disease itself. But even in kids who have the worst uveitis, they can proceed with relatively few arthritis complications. Alternatively, you can have a kid who's really sick from their arthritis but their eyes do great. We need to screen every kid who's got JIA. We need to think about combining our care with rheumatologists in every kid, but we can't use their joint inflammation as a marker for how their eyes are doing. Next slide. Some treatment caveats to consider. Eye drops don't treat joints. Just like we said, there's no correlation Kids have to keep going to their rheumatologist. They need to keep going to their eye doctor. The flip side is that not all systemic medications treat the eye. NSAIDs do virtually nothing for the eye, topical or oral. Enbrel is a very, tenorecept is a very poor drug choice if you're treating the eye, even though it may be a drug choice for treating the joints. Uveitis often requires more than just steroids. And you've seen the stepladder approach, and you need to get on that ladder sooner and higher for these, these kind of kids with the worst complications. And the worst thing we can do is we can undertreat or we can wean too fast. You know, I would say the most common cause of recurrence or difficulty in controlling uveitis is that we wean the steroids too fast or we don't treat hard enough. Next slide. If you want to kill an elephant, don't come to the game with a slingshot. You need to come to the game with your biggest guns for the sickest eyes. Next slide. If you have a kid who's got more than two plus cell, who's got posterior segment involvement, these are kids that really need you to be uh, on your big gun side. 
early on in the acute phase where the kid presents the emergency room and he's got three plus cells. Now you're using every hour topical steroids. Sometimes we're using oral and rarely even intravenous steroids are helpful in getting us through that acute phase while we ramp up if we need it uh, for higher steps on the ladder. One drug we haven't spoke about today is the subtenon T, uh, steroids. Um, subtenons is great, it takes a few days to get your response. It can last up to 12 weeks, but the key is it's a good drug for bridging between topicals and systemic. You heard that methotrexate can take a minimum of four to six weeks to work. You can have a subtenon on board. You're using methotrexate in kids where you're not controlling the steroids often, uh, and therefore that'll give you some bridge between. And we've discussed just now the intraocular implants, which we're rarely using in children. Um, next slide. Next slide. So we want to yeah. get up higher on the, on the uh, ladder quicker. Um, and I always say, go early and strong or go home. You can go back to where we were. <laughs> if you're not going to be if you're not going to be strong in the beginning, you're just going to pay the price later. If you're not, you know, if, the, if it's too hot in the kitchen, get out. Call your rheumatologist early, as Casey said. And again, Casey said, stay out of the eye. If you can avoid surgery, you will help this child. A well-controlled uveitic with a non-intumescent, non-phacolytic, non-phacomorphic uh, cataract in one eye at the age of 10 years old, the 2020 nether eye doesn't have to have surgery. Uh, consider that elective. The other issue in sick, sick eyes is don't flail with hypotony. I've seen too many patients where the pressure was low and the docs just flailed away, putting in heel on every two months, trying this and trying that. Ibopamine is a drug we had for a while. It really doesn't work that often. Sometimes you're doing more damage with your treatment than you are with the disease uh, and, you know, hypotony is bad, but often it's something the kid can live with. Next slide. Next slide. So the full court press is really important to keep these eyes under control, continued control, and to claw back when they come to us really sick. Next slide. And I think lastly, and perhaps most importantly, if you have, in order to treat this disease, be a specialist and take care of these kids, we have to spend enormous amounts of time. We have to be available. We have to be responsive. There's tremendous emotional impact on the child and impact on the family. As a result, there are many different uh, groups, support groups that I would encourage you to use, uh, arthritis specific groups, the Pediatric Glaucoma and Cataract Family Association, the UK group is very strong. These are websites we should be giving to our parents and really encouraging them and facilitating their use uh, so they don't feel like they're all alone at the end of the block uh, and they have a community that can help support them through this difficult time. Thank you very much. That was excellent, Alex. Thank you. We're going to go on to the next talk, but I think we will have ample time to address some of the additional questions. All right, Stephanie, take it uh, away. Good morning, everybody. You've made it till the last talk, so congratulations. And again, thank you, everybody, for coming on the Saturday morning of Memorial Day weekend. I want to echo what uh, previous speakers have said in thanking Ginny for being such an incredible leader and really the driving force behind this, this task force. And all the other talks have been excellent. Um, I work together with Melissa Lerman. Um, in a coordinated uveitis care clinic, and I'm going to share to you today one of the one of our patients uh, that came to us. Uh, next slide, please. So the patient is a seven-year-old girl who came for a second opinion on how to treat her active uveitis. Uh, her joints are controlled, and she's using adalimumab every two weeks, as well as sub-Q methotrexate, um, but she has some stubborn uveitis that's not controlled. So what is the next step? Next slide. Obviously, we need a little bit more history. And she's had uh, arthritis and uveitis since about age two. She's previously been on Embril, which we know does not work well for uveitis. So not surprisingly, 
she had been changed to uh, infliximab and methotrexate, which worked for about a year before she developed an uh, allergic response and has since that time has been on her current therapy of biweekly adalimumab and sub-Q methotrexate weekly. Next slide. So she's been on Remicade uh, and that has not worked. She's now on adalimumab Samara and that isn't working. Is this the time to switch to an alternative biologic? Next slide. So this is just a summary slide of some of the recommendations in the ARC. Uh, guidelines that have been uh, discussed in Dr. Lerman's talk. And um, just to review some of them quickly, so subcutaneous methotrexate is recommended over oral methotrexate, and she's on subcutaneous methotrexate. Second one, uh, monoclonal antibodies are better than etanercept. Uh, she's been, we've learned that already. Um, and she is on combination methotrexate and TNF inhibitors. So now we're at a point of saying she has an inadequate response to one TNF and dose or frequency escalation is recommended. So is she on the maximum dose of, of, of adalimumab? Um, you can advance those slides. And one more. So she's failed in fliximab and adalimumab at standard doses. The next step is to increase her adalimumab to weekly use. We recommended that, that was done, and it did provide adequate uveitis control um, and it continued to provide the good joint control. And she was able to achieve steroid-free remission for a full two years. Now what? What's the next step? Next slide. Going back to the uh, ARC guidelines, uh, in a uveitis patient who has uveitis well controlled on their DMAR biological therapy for at least two years without steroid requirement, we can start to consider tapering therapy. So that's the case for this patient who's been on, has a, had a steroid-free remission for two years on her weekly adalimumab and sub-Q methotrexate weekly. Next slide. So we took her back to the bi-weekly use, when we, which is what she was on when we first met her. And just like when we first met her, her joints remained controlled, but her uveitis became active again. So she's proven that she needs weekly adalimumab in order to stay controlled. We restarted the adalimumab at weekly administration, and fortunately, her uveitis was recaptured. She's, continued, she's been continued on um, 40 milligrams of adalimumab and 17.5 milligrams of methotrexate for one and a half years until, unfortunately, next slide, both her uveitis and her arthritis have flared on her current therapy. Well, this now is very concerning for having developed antibodies to the adalimumab. And you can test for this depending on your lab requirements. Some labs will allow you to automatically send for the antibodies, known as HAHAs in this case. And some labs make you first draw a serum drug level. And if you draw a serum drug level of adalimumab and they're on it weekly and your drug level comes back zero or very low, that would imply that there are antibodies in the serum that are binding the adalimumab and preventing it from working. And then you can send the antibodies to confirm that. So she did have a, serum, a low level of serum drug and she had positive antibodies. So now we're at a point where she has failed in fliximab and weekly adalimumab. And is it time to change biological agents? And the answer at this time is definitely yes. Next slide. Um, just advance a bit again. So if there's an inadequate response to two TNF inhibitors at the above standard dose or frequency, um, alternative biological agents like abatacept and tocilizumab are to be considered. The other medications listed here, which are part of the ACR guidelines, are DMARDs and not likely to be effective in, in this case. Uh, next slide, please. So just to briefly talk about some of the other biological options, there's galimumab, which is also known as symphony. Um, it is also a TNF inhibitor and potentially considered less immunogenic. There's tocilizumab or ectemra, which is an IL-6, uh, interferes with inter interleukin-6 inhibition. Um, patients with uveitis and animal models have shown that there are increased levels of IL-6 in their aqueous. 
Um, IL-6 works uh, by, uh, IL-6 blockade works by suppressing the induction of Th1 and Th17 cells. Uh, Albatacept is another option, or Arencia, and it inhibits the activation of T cells via CD28 blockade. This means that Arencia uh, actually works by a different mechanism than the other biologics in that it interferes with cell-cell communication and interaction rather than interfering with the cytokines themselves like the TNF inhibitors and the uh, IL-6 inhibition. Um, in this particular case, we chose to use tocilizumab. All of these medicines are available, these medicines are available in um, intravenous or subcutaneous formulations. So we chose it in a subcutaneous formulation. Um, and it did provide the uh, good control of both her uveitis and her arthritis for about the last one year. But uh, stay tuned because Several years from now, we might be in a, in a similar position. Um, one thing to note, uh, you guys might be familiar with tocilizumab as it's made the news recently as part of a treatment for patients who have uh, COVID and have suffered the uh, pulmonary effects of cytokine storm. Um, it's one of the medicines that has been effective in treating that cytokine storm. All right, well, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a lot of questions uh, and we'll try to do our best to answer them in the time we have remaining. Uh, great presentations, colleagues. Uh, so we've had a lot of questions on tapering schedule. How do you taper Pred Forte? Um, and how often do you see the patient? Um, and so if anybody would like to start by commenting on that. Uh, the, the question is, how often do I see a patient and how quickly do I taper Pred Forte? Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I try to see the patients uh, generally every every two weeks. I think in this COVID era right now, we're trying to make uh, different, different decisions so patients don't have to come into the office too much. But in a pre-COVID world, I would try to um, do one step at a time. I find that generally patients, patients it's too complicated to tell them to do four times a day for a week and then three times a day and then come back. Um, and you want to see where along the taper that they're, that they're reactivating uh, potentially. Um, but I, I feel comfortable with it every two block with one drop at a time in the two week block. And just to, and assuring that the pa if the patient still has inflammation, uh, I think this is the key point. You, you don't, you can't progress with the taper. Uh, it's just going to come back. You're basically squirting a fire with a with a water gun, as opposed to you really want a hose um, to to put the fire out permanently. Uh, another question along that same line uh, uh, is, what do you do if the pressure spikes? Um, they have ocular hypertension while you're trying to taper or treat with topical corticosteroids. I'll take that, um, and I think the first step is to ask yourself, why is this person having a pressure spike? For example, often when we treat with steroids in the beginning and we clear out all that cell and fiber from the anterior chamber, you can have a transient pressure spike from transient clogging of the trachea mesh work. If the pressure spike is in one eye and not the other, it's less likely to be a steroid response. So the first thing I'm asking myself is, why is this patient having a steroid response. Another thing I'll often do is switch to fluoromethylone, which can be surprisingly effective, perhaps not in more severe cases, but can also decrease my steroid response. Uh, and lastly, I'm always wondering if a kid is taking their glaucoma drops, if they're already on glaucoma. Uh, the most common cause for a, a failure of treatment is the lack of taking the treatment. Uh, I agree. I, I will use FML uh, as well or Lodamax, uh, but I think um, a, a key point is once a child has high pressures um, that are either, that are are on a lot of topical medications to reduce the pressure, uh, we can't really count on them to be adherent long term. So that tells us that you know that the that we need to escalate systemic treatment. 
I think that's a key point when the pressure is high, we can't depend on, you know, we can't treat part of it with just the corticosteroids. Uh, the ocular hypertension leading to glaucoma is kind of the fast death of the eye. And so it is like, it's an absolute emergency to try to, um, to uh, augment systemic therapy uh, and restore normal eye pressure. Anybody yeah. else have any other practices? I would like to add, but that's it. sorry. Um, so I would just like to add one thing. So if I start them on very frequent steroids, say every one or two hourly, then I try to taper them fast initially. So like if the inflammation is controlled, I'll bring them to six times a day, then four times a day, but then go a little slow on the taper, uh, monitoring for the glaucoma. Uh, but if I no notice any spike, I'll definitely do it faster and probably add a topical anti-glaucoma med along with it and then uh, monitor closely. Yeah, I, just, I agree with what everybody said. Sorry. I agree with what everybody said, but I think it's important to point out that if somebody's on Predforte and they need the, the Predforte and you're still treating their uveitis, their development of higher pressure isn't a reason to, to stop or taper the Predforte more quickly, but you time to add on uh, an anti-pressure medicine like COSOP um, and, and, and keep going with the steroids. It's definitely a sign you want to get a rheumatologist involved and start to think about systemic medicine, but you don't want to just take away the steroids when they need the steroids and you can treat for the meantime with the with something like COSOP. And it's important to let the family know that you expect them to stay on the glaucoma medicine for the entirety that they're on the, the steroids. Sometimes they start to just think they don't need it anymore and, and, and stop. Great point, great point. Um, add that that would also be a reason, particularly if you have a kid who's an aggressive steroid responder where their pressures are in the 50s, um, that's one of those indications that I would have to maybe jump that step in the ladder and start talking about a TNF inhibitor to get things under control a bit more quickly without having to wait for the, for the full time that methotrexate may take to work until we can wean steroids a bit more quickly. Great question and great responses. Um, uh, another question um, along the, uh, actually in the COVID area, let, let's address COVID because I'm sure that's on a lot of people's minds. Uh, does that affect the way we treat uh, uveitis or manage uveitis right now? Can, can I just take a quick stab at that before, before people answer the more uveitis associated issues? So I think the question that families and physicians are asking us is, are my patients at higher risk for getting COVID or for getting sick from COVID if they're on immunosuppressants and should they be stopping their medicines during this era? Um, first of all, no one should ever go cold turkey on their medicines. Um, but moreover, what we've been incredibly reassured to see first internationally speaking with our Italian colleagues who saw this first, and now that we have more experience in the US, we are not seeing individuals on any of our immunosuppressants, be those biologic or DMARDs, um, at least in the pediatric population, becoming more ill or more hospitalized risk um, from COVID. And there was actually just a paper that came out from our Italian colleagues, um, a meta-analysis or a review, um, looking at kids and adults on immunosuppressants showing that they don't have a higher illness or hospitalization rate. So we're really reassured to have kids stay on these medicines. Um, and there are even some trials um, in adults using TNF inhibitors to, to help with um, the, the lung disease associated with adult COVID. So, so this does not change our management. Um, the only way it's changed our management from Dr. Davidson on my perspective is we're less willing to change any medication regimen in kids who are ready to wean because we don't want them to come in as frequently, um, which is what we would do if we were weaning a child. I would echo that more for my adults than my kids that um, I'm with. I don't have a lot of kids who are on topical steroids. Most of them are, are managed on immunomodulatory therapy. Um, mm -hmm. But for my, uh, my adult patients, the wean is a lot slower because if I wean them and they flare and they have to come in urgently, um, I, don't want, I don't want them coming in more than necessary. So I'm, I'm doing much slower or weans or even holding medications um, to reduce the amount that they have to come in to see me. I think the uh, correlates of that are one, telemedicine, which many people are doing, and JIA symptoms are not going to help us. If your kids are having symptoms, 
that's a big problem. So telemedicine is going to be less effective. Uh, number two, as we all start to think about ramping up and you know, who should we see and who we shouldn't see, as much as we try to keep kids in coming in less often, and I agree, weaning less, making less changes, these are kids that I'm putting in the category of need to be seen. Um, and, you know, once they start getting out three months and I'm starting to get worried, I'm going to put my elective things uh, way behind these kids who need to be seen. They need to be monitored. That's a, that's a great point. And that actually segues into another question. In a very young child, um, uh, would you delay an exam under anesthesia because of COVID? I would say that I, we very rarely have to take young children in for an EUA. Um, I would say children 18 months up can probably get up to the slit lamp with the right encouragement. Um, uh, in my clinic, uh, if Elmo or Mickey Mouse gets up to the slit lamp first and my technician is the doctor, uh, the, the child usually will follow suit. And uh, just like uh, Casey had said, if you don't get it the first time, it's worthwhile to bring them back a second time. And I've uh, enlisted Child Life to help with that. And I would say, you know, we take very few ch children, maybe one in the last four years, um, uh, to the OR for an exam under anesthesia uh, because it's so limited. You're basically looking for, if you don't bring a slit lamp in, you're looking for are there KP or their complications. And that's not going to tell you if there's active cell. Um, no, any other is, thoughts? I was just going to say that if you have a kid who you think needs an EUA, that's usually a kid who's got a reason, who's got a problem. Uh, for me, it's most often to do a floor seating and geography for a kid who's got patent uveitis and I'm concerned about vasculitis. Those kids need to be seen. And right now we're doing EUAs on our kids who need to be seen. Um, so these aren't the kind of kid that needs an EUA is the kind of kid I was talking about. Kids who are really sick, you can't examine, you need to do something like a fluorescy. I think COVID would not prevent me from taking that kid to the OR. But they're rare, they're few and far between, fortunately. For, I think for general JIA screening, um, you know, try, try to get it in the office if you can. But absolutely, if the child has severe disease or you're following them for severe disease, got to stay on top of it. I've never in 30 years seen a kid who needed their JIA screening asleep. Uh, really, we should reserve that for kids who've got real big problems. Great comment there. So we have a surgical question. Um, what do you do if you have a patient who's well controlled on systemic therapy, so quiet in both eyes, and has a white cataract um, and is either in scenario one is in the amblyogenic age group versus uh, an older child? Uh, if anybody could comment on that. Uh, first, I'd say that the dictum is that the eye needs to be quiet for three months before consideration of intraocular surgery for, for cataract surgery. So uh, even if they're amblyogenic, hopefully you, you can, can wait that three months. Um, and then they do need extra steroid support around, around surgery. So I try to communicate with rheumatology and time there. Uh, if, the, if they're on a TNF inhibitor, try to time the administration of the TNF inhibitor to their uh, to their surgery, um, so that they're they're, um, they're they have a high load of, of med in their system. They're not at a trough, and um, and they, some people start oral steroids in the perioperative period, a um, uh, few days before and for a week afterwards. Or you can give IV solumedrol at the time of surgery too. I do the same. I use a perioperative course of. Um... PO steroids, one, usually one per kilo per day, starting three days before the surgery and continuing for about a week after. I give intravenous during the surgery. I double their topical dose of PRED before the surgery and continue high dose for the first few days or a week or so after surgery. As far as the timing, Stephanie, uh, if the kid is phacolytic or phacomorphic, I would uh, definitely go forward with surgery instead of waiting for three months. If they have glaucoma with high pressures and need surgery, I'll do that instead of waiting three months. But I think that older kid with a cataract, I'm trying not to do surgery uh, if I can. And I love glaucoma medications. If I could use glaucoma medications and stay out of the eye for a glaucoma operation, 
I'll take that every day. I would say for a kid out of the amblyogenic range, um, as you know, depend it depends on how disabled they are from school functions. I had a a girl who um, was 12 and was 20 20 in one eye and 2400 in the other eye. She presented with almost 360 synechia, um, you know, and and IK touch and just really um, really severe severe inflammation. Um, I waited for a year before before I did her cataract. I, I want them to be quiet because if you if you do that three month window um, in JIA kids, they just tend to have um, they tend to have worse prognoses. And if, if they're functioning, if they have good enough vision um, to do their day to day activities, and you can push it out um, and keep them quiet for a year before surgery, that's my comfort level. I would just like to add one point. So if the inflammation is well controlled for three months, I don't think it's a contraindication for IOL implantation. I would still go ahead with the IOL implantation. Just make sure the inflammation is controlled. You cover it with oral steroids starting uh, three to five days before surgery and then a week after surgery uh, and then more frequent topical steroids after surgery. And then uh, monitor for the IOP, as I said, if needed, uh, I would add the the co-opt or timolol post-operatively if they are showing a little spike, but I would definitely go ahead with the IOL implantation. And that's a, that was another question with IOL implantation. There's several studies with long-term follow-up with good outcomes um, in terms of kids that might not be a candidate for an IOL if, if they have hypotony or really severe disease um, or um, Occasion if they're if they're not adherent, uh, you ha they have to be able to follow up. Um, I would definitely uh, hold off on putting an IOL in those cases. Anybody else have criteria for using I IOLs would, or not? I would strongly recommend against an IOL in these kids. It's like putting a bomb in a kid's eye. Um, if they, you know, many papers when it works, it's wonderful. We all pat ourselves on the back, but when it doesn't work, it's a disaster. Uh, and I would not consider an IOL on a kid with uveitis for at least a year off medicine uh, and quiet. Uh, at the very least, these kids do poorly uh, sometimes, and when they do poorly, it is bad. I think it depends upon the control of uveitis. If it's very well controlled, uh, I would do it. But if they have a very prolonged course and it's very complicated with hypotony and uh, then probably I would defer, but most of the time, if it's well controlled, uh, many of those kids, they do pretty well. I don't see any reason leaving them a fake it just for that. And, and not to make a spoiler alert, uh, but if, if people are interested, um, we were considering doing uveitis gone wild uh, and, and doing a surgical webinar. So if you are interested in, in that, that more in-depth coverage of that topic, please let us know when you do your evaluations. Now, I did want to talk about Durazol because there are some questions on Durazol. Um, it's better compliance, less uh, easier to use. Um, why avoid it? So um, we just see much higher higher rates of complications. We see we see earlier formation of cataracts, more um, a higher incidence of cataract formation. Um, and as I said, the the steroid responsiveness, where it's really significant spikes in steroids. So, particularly kids under 10, um, you know, you see you see really uh, um, aggressive steroid response, and so. Um, I generally try to avoid it. I also find that if they're shaking the drop appropriately, then they have they usually you know have a good response. Even even if you have to use the the prednisolone every hour, they may not be compliant with it. But if they're shaking it enough, then then they probably are gonna are gonna be controlled with that. And really, if they're not um, and there's significant enough inflammation, I'm I'm leaning more towards oral steroids anyway in a case like that probably. Uh, but that being said, in, in a teenager, I may be more open to Durazol if, um, if I'm, I'm not concerned about compliance, because that's another issue I worry about if they're not compliant and I miss that pressure spike is a reason why I really don't, um, don't like to use it in, in younger kids. Great point. Durazol is, greatly, Durazol is greatly effective and it is less administration. And so um, that, those are wonderful, but it really should be reserved for kids that are not doing well on Pred Forte alone. It's Alex called an IOL a ticking time bomb. I think Durazol is a ticking time bomb. 
there's no safe amount of time for them to be on it where you feel like, oh, they're not having a pressure problem. It's okay. I can use the Durazol. Um, it, it can happen at any time. And then the pressures go very, very high. And even switching back to Pred Forte, they all of a sudden now are responding to Pred Forte. It's not that their steroid response goes away. It's almost just gets them set. Um, and they're, and it just can get very scary. So if, I think if you've seen that once or twice, you will understand why you have a strong reservation for using Durazol. So it definitely has a role. Um, I particularly have some difficulty getting it for my patients. Medicaid around uh, Philadelphia area doesn't cover it. Um, but uh, it, it, it used when absolutely necessary. It should definitely not be your starting topical steroid of choice. And the, on that line, the IOP can spike within uh, three weeks of use. Um, so I need to follow them weekly, which is a large burden of, uh, of monitoring. Um, yeah, anybody else with experience with Durazol? Yay, nay? I don't prefer to use it. I would still stick with prednisone. Uh, I have had a couple of kids who have been referred from outside who are on Durosol, uh, but then I try to switch them over just because of the risk of IOP. Um, um, so I would just reserve it only if it's really needed. So I would still go first with the topical prednisone more frequently, bump up the, the systemic treatment uh, and try to differ from starting Durosol if possible. I kind of regard it as an STK. It's, you know, it's, it, it, it can cause pressure spikes that warrant a surgical intervention in an eye that's not controlled. And that's, that's, uh, that's not a position you would like to be in. Um, in regard to adherence to pred acetate, um, for some of my families, I've gone as far as um, a note to school and having the school nurse administer the medications, uh, the shaking of the bottle, and actually having our nurses call the school nurse just to make sure that the medication is being given. And that's actually worked surprisingly well uh, because the nurses, you know, it's a basically a medication order while they're in school. Um, they have to, they have to get the eye drop. Uh, so that's a strategy that has worked well. The other thing you can do is you can request the brand name Pred Forte, because as I said, if this is really important point for everyone, I think. Yeah. So uh, the brand name Pred Forte again, even okay, if uh, that's okay, no worries. Um, if they're if they're shaking um, if they're shaking the uh, bottle, you know, adequately more or less, they may still get a bit more of the medication with the brand name. Um, so there's there uh, is is kind of general support in the immuvitis community that Pred, Pred Forte brand name works works better, uh, but it's just because of of how the formulation is made. Well, the point I was going to make, getting back to what Chidi said, is. It is not legal for a child to be denied drops in school. Schools have to get kids their drops. Uh, and we have to support the families and the kids getting the schools to give the kids a drop. Uh, it, it's like a school can't turn you away if you have diabetes. They can't turn you away because you need eye drops. And that's really important for us to advocate for the kids. All right. So one la uh, one last question here. We're nearing the end. Um, how long does one follow a patient with ANA positive JIA who has never developed uveitis and um, is either off systemic treatment or has been tapered off of systemic treatment? So the, the teaching um, is that they should always be followed at least yearly for the rest of their life. Um, the risk of developing uveitis much, much later is quite, quite low, um, but a yearly eye exam is definitely not severely burdensome for an individual. So um, that's what we teach as rheumatologists. Any other factors? Yeah that matters is the age where, where what age they're at um you know if they're a younger kid I, I may still be following them a little bit more frequently than that um if they're if they're late you know late adolescent then then uh, i'm going to be more comfortable with just annual uh, same and with right, right, oh, the guidelines say okay Melissa. 
I just think the guidelines still say it's say our age base. So it depends on how long you've had the UAS. If it's less than four years, more than four years. If you're under seven, more than seven. So some people it's every six months, but then it will ultimately spaced every 12. So just to, it's in those guidelines. So the big picture is that uh, you're going to follow a child every three months for four years if they're in that high-risk category of developing uveitis. Um, sort of the, um, and if they've been on a systemic during that time frame, and now they're about to come off of their systemic, let's say you've been following them for five years and they never had uveitis, but they've been on methotrexate that whole time or Humira that whole time, and now all of a sudden they're going to, rheumatology says it's time to take you off, I think you need to go back to following them very frequently because maybe they would have developed methotrexate, maybe they would have developed uveitis that now they're off their systemic and the uveitis will be allowed to, to um, blossom when it was being suppressed before. Great point. Yeah, I think I agree with that. I was about to say the same thing. If my criteria would be the age, so seven years up to the diagnosis, I would follow them closely. So up to age seven, every three months. After that, every six months, and then uh, probably yearly after that. And then, uh, as Stephanie said, closely when they are uh, getting off their systemic meds. Well, great. Thanks, everybody. Um, well, if there are any questions we didn't address, we will actually do a document uh, where we try to, and actually we'll even include the questions that were answered. I've, I've written down some of the responses here. I uh, just want to thank all of the panelists for, for their time and their presentations and thank all of the attendees today uh, who gave up two hours on a Saturday morning to help kids with uveitis. Um, so I guess we shall adjourn. Thanks so much, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye.